everyone. My name is Christophe Nazar and I would like to welcome you to a new episode of the Windows Store Application Developer Series. Today, live from the French Microsoft headquarters, I will talk about the automatic suspension and resuming for Windows 8 applications. And as usual, we'll talk about the impact on your own code. Follow me. As Robert mentioned in our first episode, you need to be aware of how your Windows Store app behaves in Windows 8. I'm going to explain to you the new WinRT process lifecycle management and I'll show you how to avoid the new pitfalls with code and tools. Let's start with the high level summary of the different states of a Windows Store application. An application starts running for different ways. The most common activation scenario is when the user taps a tile on the start screen, but it is also possible to activate an app by a search query or through a share action. When another app gets activated by the user and takes the whole screen, the previous app goes to a suspended state after a short period of time. In that state, none of its threads will be scheduled by the kernel, so none of your code will run. This is why a suspending event lets your app know that it needs to save its current state before the kernel frees you. Only 5 seconds are available for your app to do so. If it takes more than 5 seconds, it will be terminated by Windows. The same thing happens when another app goes to the foreground, the second app gets also suspended. And so on for each new Windows Store app that gets activated to the foreground. In some cases, such as under high memory pressure, a Windows Store app can be automatically terminated by the system and removed from memory. Since the app is already in a suspended state where none of its thread is running, there is no notification of the termination. We'll see in a minute during the demo what you need to do to handle this situation. When a suspended app gets reactivated by the user and all its thread will be scheduled by the kernel and it runs again instantly, your app can be notified of this change by listening to the resuming events. The underlying mechanism and choices made by the Windows team to implement this process lifecycle management are very clearly explained by Arun Kishan on channel 9. I would highly recommend that you watch this video where background tasks are also detailed. Now, let's see the impacts of this process lifecycle for your app. First, I want to show you how to use the task manager in order to find out the suspended applications. The user experience of this tool has been greatly changed compared to previous versions of Windows. In the first tab, you get the list of processes and in the status column, you know whether they are suspended or not suspended. If you don't see the suspended string here in this column, it is because the view menu and the status value didn't have the show selected suspended selected. Because by default, this is the hide suspended status, which is cell selected. So if you see here, we have four Windows Store applications that get suspended. We have the store, the music and the maps. Sorry about the French names, but as you can tell from my accent, I'm French, so this is why you see the French name of the, of the application. If I'm double-clicking on one of the application, immediately it goes to the foreground, to the screen. By the way, this is where, my, this is where I'm, I'm living. If you go back to the task manager, you can see that the map application doesn't get suspended immediately. We have to wait a couple of seconds. It's like 10 seconds before it really gets suspended by Windows. Here we are. And this is done because Windows expect that in some scenarios, the end user will switch back and forth between applications. And in that case, it doesn't want to spend the time to uh, suspend the application and then put it back. So there is a 10 seconds timing between the time when the application is in the foreground, is on the screen and goes to the background. That's, that's uh, a way to maximize the user experience. So let's go to the source code to see how this impacts our code. I will be using the same full of activation code sample that I've been using in my previous episode. And here in the application constructor, you can see that Visual Studio has generated this code for me when I created the application. It registered the onSuspending event handler method to the suspending event. Let's take a look at the source code for the onSuspending default implementation. The default implementation 
here's these three lines of code. I will go back to these three lines of code, but before, I want to show you one tiny piece of information that gets passed to you in the suspending event args. In the suspending event args, you get a property called suspension operation, and this suspension operation provides a deadline property. This deadline is the time in the future when Windows will decide to terminate your application if you didn't save your state right now. So you have between that time dot now and the deadline to save your state. By the way, the value of this difference is 5 seconds. So the code generated by Visual Studio to save your state is in these three lines of code. You could expect to have just only one line of code, which is, OK, Windows, I will be saving my state. But by the way, since the code to save our state in the suspension manager, I won't dig into the detail about that today, but just to say that this is done in the suspension manager dot save async method. And this method is asynchronous. It means that as soon as we are executing this code, stuff will be generated for you by the compiler, but what is done is there is another thread that will run this code, this save async, and it means that the thread which is running the unsuspending method, which is the event handler for the suspending event by Windows, will return immediately. And it means to, to Windows that, okay, I've just asked this application to get suspended, and so to store its state before all the thread will be frozen. As soon as the code returns to me, I know that it's done with saving the state. But here we have a problem because this will be done in another thread. And we don't want to wait here in this thread. So this is the pattern used by WinRT to support what I would call a kind of asynchronous event handling. It means that from the parameters I get from the, the event handler in the suspending event args, I get the same suspending operation, and I get an object called a deferral from the get deferral method. And this is a kind of transaction. It means that uh, if you don't call the complete method, Windows will wait and say, OK, the saving is not done already. The, end, the event is not really handled until the end. So I need to wait. OK, you remember that it would wait only five seconds. Uh, after these five seconds, it will terminate your application. But before these five seconds, you can return from your handler and you can do your work, your saving in another thread. And when you are done with saving your state, then you can call complete on the deferral object. It's, it's quite simple in terms of, of syntax. You get the deferral, you do all your work asynchronously, and when this is done, then you call complete. There is another question you might ask here is, um, you know what, uh, this is nice that I get this uh, suspending event after 10 seconds, but 10 seconds is quite long. I mean that I'm writing a game, for example, and I want to pause my game immediately um, after the end user switch from my game to another application. And I don't want to wait 10 seconds because I don't want that the game keep on playing while there is nobody in front of the screen, in front of the game itself. And here, you can't use the suspending event. You can't put your code of the pausing of the game in the unsuspending event handler. So you need another way. And this is what I will show you right now. There is a, an, an event, not on the application, but on every window. So I will go to the onLaunch implementation. You remember the onLaunch override is called by Windows when the end user type on a tile in the start screen. And so what does this method is create the main window of the application and it's uh, it's done here in the navigate to the grouped items page and this grouped item page is adding into the stack of the frame and the frame is really the content of the window so the current window the content of the current window will be the frame it will never change even if you navigate from one window to the other window for windows the current will be the, the frame so what I'm doing here is I'm listening to the visibility change of this window and I'm asking window, okay, call my own visibility chain event handler when the visibility change event is triggered. And then I can activate my frame, which will show the first uh, window 
which is the grouped item page on a stack. So let's see what's on the on visibility change. What's the code? The code is very simple. It's just a right line. And what I'm showing in the in the right line in the output is the value of the visible property of the visibility change event task parameters that I re that I'm receiving. And as you can see here from this line of code, here visible is true. It means that my application is going to the foreground, is going back to the screen. And if it's false, then it means that the application is leaving the main screen, it's going to the background. And this event, the visibility change event, is received immediately. You won't wait 10 seconds. Unlike for the suspending event, the Visual Studio template does not generate any code for the resuming event. Why? Simply because the app was suspended, but was still in memory, and will run again immediately when the end user goes back to it. So, nothing special to do in your code. Well, in some cases, you might need to take advantage of this event to refresh your content. For example, a news app could fetch headline news if it has been suspended for, let's say, more than four hours. Unfortunately, the suspending event arc does not provide this kind of information. However, it's not too complicated to implement. Let's go back to our full of activation example. If you remember from our previous post, the suspending event was listened by the unsuspended event handler that was automatically generated for us by Visual Studio. So we need to do the same by hand for the resuming event. Let's wait for the resuming event. And we will let Visual Studio generate for us the code for this app. So we do a tab to get the name of our event handler. Let's keep, let's say consistent, I have the on resuming name. It will generate an empty stub for us where we will add some code. For example, a debug.writeline. Oops, sorry, debug.writeline. And a simple trace about, okay, we will are on the on resuming event handler. Simple. Now, uh, what should we do if we want to keep track to keep to know what is the time that was elapsed from the time when we get suspended until the time we get resumed? Simple. We do exactly that. We go into the unsuspending event handler and we keep track in the settings of the application of the current time there, just before get getting suspended by, by Windows. So it's in the application data, the current, we are looking for the local settings and the values property, which is a, di a dictionary where we'll be able to store and retrieve the information by key. And the name of the key will be, let's say, suspension time. We will keep track of the suspension time and the suspension time we get get with the dot time offset dot now. And so we have kept the time when we will be suspended into our settings. And now when we will get resumed by Windows, we will need to compare with the current that time, which is that time offset dot now, same code, minus the time that we saved into the local settings. So we just copy and paste the same code minus and then it should be fine. There is a tiny code that we need to ask. Uh, the values dictionary is typeless so we need to do an explicit type, type cast that time offset here and we will get a difference between two that time offset which is a time span. Oh, sorry time span and it will be elapse. Fine so we have the time during which our application was suspended. Let's do another right line to see this time. So we have the on resuming. Let's do a tiny formatting and we will show the elapse. As you can see, a couple of lines of code in on resuming, one line of code in the on suspending, and you get the information you want. So let's debug this code to ensure that uh, everything works the way we expect. Let's put a breakpoint into the on suspending and same for the on resuming. And we will start a debugging session by doing F5. The application will start. We will get the nice splash screen that I've updated. And then we will go back to the desktop 
wait with the task manager, as I explained in the previous post, and we will wait for the full of activation application to be suspended in 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6. Okay, I won't wait any longer because I know something that is a little bit disturbing at the beginning, which is if your application is debugged by a debugger, then it will never be suspended. That's a big problem for us because we want to, to test that and uh, that doesn't seem to be, to be possible. Well, in fact, it's possible because Visual Studio provides you with some of the commands in the toolbar. You see here we have the suspend, the resume and the suspend and shutdown. This is the way that we can simulate a suspension or a resuming in a debugging session. So if I click on suspend here, I will get my breakpoint triggered, which is exactly what we what we expect. And we can take a look at the output and you will see that the time, let's go do a tiny zoom here. You can see, sorry about that, you can see that the time before Windows will decide that we will terminate if we didn't do all our saving. It's uh, almost five seconds for dot ninety seven. Let's zoom. So here we are in the suspending. We will just do F five to continue, and when we will get resume, and we need to trigger that. Okay, so I'm just waiting a little bit, like five, six, seven, and let's go to resume now. And now we have the difference between the time it is now and the time that we did the suspension and the elapse is around is around nine, a little bit more than nine seconds. You see, simple to do, simple to debug. I think it's a, it's a good integration with uh, Visual Studio. I'm just finishing my debugging session. I'm closing the application, go back to the source code and uh, as you can see everything is nice. There is a tiny glitch that you might encounter uh, in during your, your experience. Let's go back to my debugging session F5 and I want to show you one tiny detail. Maybe you might not see this uh, this specific toolbar and this is because you didn't select this toolbar to be visible in Visual Studio so you just right click in the toolbar and you need to have the debug lo location selected. If you don't have the debug location selected, I will just demo that now. You see, you won't see this uh, this this toolbar. So go to the toolbar and select debug sele debug location, so you can have access to this uh, this uh, commands special command to debug the suspend and the resume.